So we'll transition now to a couple talks uh, really focused on our Kansas swine industry. Um, but one of the things first that I did here, for those that don't know, there might be a little uh, basketball game down the road here tonight. And when we saw that unemployment statistic, I was thinking, you know, that is pretty stagnant, but that, that may go up since uh, hopefully there's about 12 players down the road that will go off payroll soon. So that uh, there might be a few more employees on the market. Um, but as we transition to our Kansas uh, so as we, we talked about speakers, one of the things that we, we have, and as I look out in the room, many of you uh, Kansas producers have, have, have increased your business over the last, you know, several decades. In terms of the growth that you have, we have opportunities of other businesses coming in as well. So we kind of have that complementary, and this is no different than any other state. You have your base of producers uh, that are building their operations, and you also have operations looking to uh, move into different parts of the country for various reasons, and certainly we have have some biosecurity advantages here in Kansas due to population density in some of our parts of the state. And so as we were talking about speakers, we thought it was very timely to have uh, somebody from the Carthage Veterinary System that's been putting in some sow units in Kansas to visit about those opportunities that they've seen here in Kansas. We have Dr. Clayton Johnson, who's a DVM and Director of Health at the Carthage Veterinary Services located in Carthage, Illinois. Um, he attended University of Illinois and got his DVM um, at that location. It, previously, before being employed with Carthage, he was part of the Mashoff system and helped with their, uh, was the director of health and animal care for that. So this is just one example of, of uh, outward business as most recently has introduced and, and been part of the Kansas uh, uh, industry. Um, they have three sow farms that he is directly uh, the main contact and helps oversee the management and health of those operations. And uh, he will go into more detail of that. But what, let me give, let's all give a welcome to Dr. Clayton Johnson for his presentation. All right, thank you guys. Can everybody hear me okay? Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, as Joel said, I'm not an alum of Kansas State, um, so I was, I was a bit surprised, Mike, when I got the invitation to come and speak. Um, very, very honored, but as I read through, I pretty quickly understood why I was selected. Mike said, you know, we have a world-class nutrition program here at Kansas State. We're having this meeting. We do think it's important to have the token dumb veterinarian speech somewhere inserted into there. Um, then thanks for putting me after the economist because now I'm really going to look bad. But so I saw that and said, okay. So I emailed my good friend Steve Henry and I said, Steve, what do I do to prepare for this request? And Steve said, nothing. You're perfect. Just come as you are. So I think I can fulfill the role I've been asked to fulfill today. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit um, about an opportunity that we endeavored upon about three years ago, starting three years ago. It was a significant opportunity for our system. And that was to partner with some local producers here, partner with some folks in Illinois and, and a large customer to build the largest large white purebred herd pod of, of farms in the United States and as far as we can tell um, in the world. Uh, I'm sure that the Chinese would probably claim they have a, a larger large bred purebred herd, but I think their definition of a purebred may be slightly different than ours. So it's, uh, it's been a very wonderful opportunity to get to work on. Um, of that pot of sows, 75% of them do live in Kansas. Um, so we've been very fortunate to be able to work with some of the local communities here to build those farms, staff those farms, stock those farms, and then now operate those farms. So we'll talk to you a, a little bit today about the Carthage system and what that is, our experiences in Kansas, why we thought that was an attractive opportunity to come do this in Kansas when obviously Illinois is home for most of us that work at Carthage, and then uh, going forward, what do we see as, as future opportunities? Carthage is really a company of companies. So Carthage is actually a city in Illinois. Um, Carthage, Illinois is where the Carthage Veterinary Services was established by Joe Connor um, in 1873, I think, no. <laughs> A long time ago. But Joe has obviously been very, very successful and is built on the success of just the veterinary clinic. Um, the veterinary clinic's one of several companies that you see up here, but really our companies mostly exist to service what we call the Carthage system. The Carthage system is not a company. So of what you see up here, the Carthage system is more of an idea and a concept than it is a, a true LLC or a business entity. The Carthage system is all of the producers that we work with 
to provide everything from veterinary services, management services, nutrition services, marketing, logistics, everything that we can do to try and help them operate our, their business. Um, all of our businesses really serve to support the Carthage system. And we do work with some outside clients, uh, particularly internationally, that we don't consider part of the Carthage system. They don't market their pigs through us. We don't operate any sow centers for them. So Carthage Vet Service still does classic consulting services. But where we've grown our business has primarily been through this Carthage system concept and model. We've also got a research wing of the Carthage business. We call Carthage Innovative Swine Solutions. That research program is a combination of contract research. Um, we've got several research barns I'll show you some pictures of. But then also we have a group of our producers in the Carthage system that pay a, a small uh, fee every month to be a part of that research program. Those fees turn into money for projects, and those projects and the results and data that's generated are all owned by those producers. So we can test uh, different genetics, diets, uh, uh, medication programs, vaccine programs, et cetera, in our system, in research barns that we control and operate, and then bring those results to the producers to help them to improve profitability on their end. Here's a picture of all of us veterinarians. There's 11 of us that work exclusively with swine. Um, we've had a big transition in our business uh, about four months ago. Um, Joe, who started the company, uh, is not retired. So I want to make that very clear. He's very sensitive about that. He's not retired. But Joe has transitioned and has sold his shares in all of the different businesses that we work in. Um, Joe is still very much involved in our business comes to work every single day, um, continues to work with us uh, and advise us at a high level on how we can continue to build on the platform that he's built. But we now have a new president of Carthage Veterinary Services, and that's Dr. Aaron Lauer. Aaron and I went to veterinary school together at Illinois. He started directly at uh, Carthage Veterinary Services right out of school and has been with the company for, it'd be 10 years now. Um, we've also got a core group of owners that have been there for quite some time. Uh, Bill Hollis, Doug Groth, and Dania Clausen all have been owners in the system for several years. I joined the group uh, three years ago, but just joined the group as an owner here recently. Um, and then uh, also brought on some uh, uh, what had been associates as uh, owners in the business, Will, Dr. Will Von Bell and Dr. Attila Farkas. And then we've got three associates down here, Dr. Neil Benjamin, Dr. Claire Lefebvre, and then Dr. Elise Tuhill, who joined us, uh, transitioned with me from uh, Mashoffs here just recently. PSM is a sister company to the veterinary clinic. Professional Swine Management is the management company that we operate to run the farms in the Carthage system. Okay? So PSM is a different business entity than Carthage Veterinary Service. PSM's role is to manage and operate primarily sow farms, but also growing pig farms as well. Uh, PSM manages about 170,000 sows right now. I'll show you how that growth has played out. Uh, I think we're at 33 farms at the end of 2018. Uh, we don't have significant uh, farm build plans in 2019 as most of the industry has, but have grown that number quite a bit here recently. Um, and we don't finish the majority of those pigs. We'll talk a little bit about our business model, but most of those pigs are, are, pr are produced at the owners of the sow farms that we manage. So we manage the pigs until weaning, they get shipped to a uh, wean to finish barn, and those pigs are, are managed by the producers who own those pigs at that point. For a subset of those, about 600,000 this year, we do manage those pigs. Um, historically, that's been a lot of gilt grow out, gilt development that then gets sold as select weight gilts. But then we've also added a couple hundred thousand pigs here in the last year as part of that new Clemens packing plant that Lee showed you, the one up in Coldwater, Michigan. Uh, we've got a couple hundred uh, thousand pigs on feed that go up to that packing plant every year. So here you can see our Carthage system logo. We really are uh, a family farm enterprise. Uh, I think we've got a little over 200 business owners each one of those 30, 32, 33 sow farms is a different LLC, and each one has a different group of owners. That could be one owner. It could be one person who owns that entire sow farm and takes all the pigs out of that farm, feeds all those pigs. That could be 25 people that each own 50 shares, 100 shares, 200 shares, and generally each share is a sow. 
So they take pigs when it's their turn to take pigs. But the, the business structure is consistent. The number of owners in each business is very different. So as a result, we've got many, many, many different customers. We've got packing plants for the pigs that we finish. We've got the owners of the pigs for the pigs that we're just managing through weaning. And 200 plus of those folks that we need to keep happy uh, as often as we can. Um, here's some of the growth of that professional swine management company. Again, these are all the sows that we would manage, um, starting with the first farm that was built in 1995. That was actually a multiplier farm uh, built by producers who wanted a very stable and consistent supply of high health gilts. Um, built that and then saw an opportunity to build commercial farms as well. Uh, and as more commercial farms got built, certainly more multipliers had to get built to, to link the chain. Lee showed a slide of industry growth in terms of pounds of pork produced, I think what was up there. Um, you can see that our growth is highly correlated with what he showed you. 2000, early 2000s had a bit of a growth spurt there. 2004 to 2007 really ramped out, up and, and uh, accelerated the pace of growth. And then we're just coming out of a very large scale growth spurt here. A big chunk of that has been in Kansas, also a decent amount of growth in Illinois, in Missouri, and one farm in Nebraska as well. Um, do expect that to plateau here a little bit over the next year or two, but as Lee said, there's tremendous uncertainty in the market. And if there's anything that I know about our industry, it's that if producers see dollar signs, they will think, well, man, if I had another 6,000 sales, the dollar signs would go up even higher. So I could see the expansion jumping right back into full-blown expansion mode in a short amount of time if industry profitability drives us that direction. Here's kind of a schematic of where those sows are located. Historically, most of our production has been in west central Illinois. And if you looked at where Carthage is, it'd basically be about right here on the map. So we've got about 100,000 sows that are probably within 50, 60 miles of Carthage. Um, and grew what was historically not a very pig dense area into now, it's pretty pig dense there. Um, so we've kind of tapped out, I guess you could say, the, the local area in terms of labor availability um, and, and really our ability to grow there and do so in a biosecure manner. Uh, there's just aren't, you look at that cluster, there's not a lot of places where we can lay down new farms that we aren't laying them down right next to other farms. And as you guys know, pig density is a big driver of locating these new sites. And so kind of uh, ran out of room in West Central Illinois. We've expanded a little bit into Missouri, um, uh, built a, a farm up here, here last year. Um, also have expanded a little bit further east in Illinois. We do manage some finishing pigs in Iowa and in Indiana, uh, also in Michigan for that cold water plant. Um, we don't have the finishing on here. All the dots you see are just the sow farms. But we have strategically decided that, raising, that having sow farms in Iowa may not be the best idea. Um, I know that's kind of a, yeah, duh statement. Um, the reality is there's some reasonable locations in Iowa, right? No, I mean, it's, there's some parts there that aren't tremendously pig dense, but the second you tell somebody you're building their brand new sow farm in Iowa, the eyes start to roll back in their head and uh, the conversation doesn't go very far from there. So we've stayed out of Iowa for sow centers. Uh, came out here to Kansas. We've got a farm, I was actually up at this farm yesterday. This farm's up by Osborne and then one here in Salina, and another that's about 30 miles from Hayes, um, just past a little town called Pfeiffer, Kansas. All these have been built within the last three years. Uh, this would represent that large white herd that I mentioned. This would be about, uh, about 19,000 of those sows would be encompassed in those three farms. And then one other farm up here in Nebraska that's not on there, one other sow center that's got the rest of that large white herd. So four distinct large white herds that have been built, uh, three of them here in Kansas. So I'll talk to you a little bit about the business model of farms that we work with in the Carthage system. There's, I'm oversimplifying, but there's really two main paths that you can go down. One would be the classic user group type of a farm system. And the most common owners in those farms are folks that have raised sows at home, and for whatever reason, they've decided raising sows is not a lot of fun. I want to get out of making my own pigs. I still want to feed pigs because I've got finishing barns. I've got crop ground I want to put the manure on, so I still really want to feed pigs. But the sow farm is a tremendously different workload and labor responsibility than the wean to finish barns. So those folks would come to us, we'd aggregate them into a group until we've got a reasonable number of folks in terms of how many sows that they need for their production needs. And we'd say, all right, you guys kind of all fit together. Let's, let's talk about building a sow center together. In, in that model, 
generally it's independent producers and they take all the pigs out of the sow farm. So if it's a 6,000 head sow farm and you make 150,000 pigs during the year and there's one owner, he gets all 150,000 pigs. If there's two, you split them 75,000, 75,000, okay? And we try to be very customer focused on how that plays out from a logistics standpoint. When I was at Mashoffs, the marketing schedule drove all of the logistics, right? Your pig space and your animal movements is just one big circle. So you got to move pigs at some point to create a space for other pigs to go through. And because the marketing people generally made all the money for the company, they seemed to get to pick first on what they wanted to do. So when they would market pigs out of a site, that would create space available. If we had, for some reason, too many pigs at the sow farm and we had to wean them, well, we had to wean them. So that might push the marketing schedule up. But it really was, um, wasn't something that the sow farm could dictate. In our system, the sow farms do dictate the weaning schedules. And when I say that, the owners of the sow farms often dictate the weaning schedules. You guys know what it's like to be marketing pigs when prices are really good and say, can you give me an extra week, right? Is there any way I can have an extra week to put a few more pounds on these pigs so I can get them uh, a better price on them or higher weights at the same price? So we try to be very customer focused on that. It does create some hassles, but uh, we build all the farms with holding room nurseries so that we can uh, continue to wean per normal schedule if we need to, hold those pigs for a couple days, week, whatever it is, and then ship them when they're ready. We do occasionally have people that uh, say they get out of the wean to finish business, but they still want to own their sow shares. That's fine. We'll sell those pigs on the spot as well. So we sell a decent number of wean pigs out of our system. That could either be on a long-term contract or that could just be a spot sale where, all right, I don't want my group of pigs or the sow farm's overproducing right now and I don't want the extra pigs. So we schedule in some, uh, a sold pig group in there just to get a little bit of relief on the sow farm and, and keep everybody happy with when they're getting pigs on the schedule. In this situation, the sow farm is not meant to make money. Uh, the sow farm is really just a pass-through entity because the, the people that are feeding the pigs post-weaning, they own the sow farm, they own the sows, they own the production of it. Every quarter, those folks will get together. They'll look at the schedule coming up and say, all right, we're going to wean 40,000 pigs over the next quarter, and our operating costs are going to be 60,000 bucks a month or something like that, and we're going to figure out how much the wean pig price needs to be so that the sow farm doesn't uh, overprice the wean pigs and that each of the producers aren't paying anything extra than what they need to for the wean pigs. Cheaper we can make the wean pigs in this situation, the better. Um, when we look at the investor model, this has developed more, I would say, over the last five years where some producers uh, have, have done a really good job of making money and like any good farmer, they don't want to invest it anywhere but agriculture and they may not want to raise more pigs right now but they know there's demand for wean pigs. And we feel like we have a reasonable reputation of, of producing high quality wean pigs. Maybe not all of them, Lisa, but most of them are pretty good. Um, folks will come to us and they'll say, eh, I want to sign a long-term contract to buy wean pigs. I really don't want to own the sows though. So then we'll look for investors and we'll say, we have this revenue opportunity right here. And we think that we can produce pigs at this sort of a margin where this sow farm can make money. And those folks would not take the pigs in this situation, and the sow farm would be a profit center. The goal of the sow farm is to make money so that the investors in that sow farm, like any other investment, take home a return, take up dividends out of that sow farm. So in that situation, we'd negotiate with the wean pigs that are sold on contract and try and set that price as high as we can, obviously, to increase the revenues for the farm. But a couple of different business models, obviously that's oversimplifying it, and there are many different other creative ways in which the farms can be operated. But those would be kind of the two most common situations we get into. And the farms that we have built out here in Kansas have generally been more of that investor model situation. We had a great opportunity to make gilts for a very large customer, negotiated what the price on those gilts would be, put together a cash flow and a business plan for the farms, what did we need to, to make pigs for in terms of the price per pig of producing pigs in order to generate revenue for investors, and then took that to people um, who contributed capital to those sow farms. What sort of uh, services does our management system do? We really try to be all-encompassing in terms of providing solutions for the farm. So if you're an owner in the farm, you can absolutely be as involved as you want to in the day-to-day. -day. And as you would guess, there's a big continuum on how much people want to be involved. Some people really just, you know, take care of it, handle it, trust you guys, make, make, make me money and, and make the pigs good and, and life will be fine. Other people really want to dig into the records, you know, go through all the costs, line item detail by line item detail. At a minimum, we meet with the owners once a quarter 
to share that information, but we're always open to, to working with them in a more collaborative or, or a shorter time frame if that's the request. We do all the production services, and when I thought through the services for this slide, I tried to put more bullet points for the more important services that we provide, because I would tell you really production and human resources are probably the two most important things that we do for the farms. The two things that we get the most feedback on from people that want us to build a sow center for them is they say, managing the people on the farm is really, really tough, and I don't want to do that anymore. And that's a big part of what we do. On the production side, we obviously manage the facility full time. We're running all the alarms, all the emergencies. Uh, if a roof collapses, which we had a couple of weeks ago with all the snow in Illinois, we're the ones on site in the middle of the night. We're the ones coordinating, getting all the disaster people involved, coordinating, getting the pigs out of the barn, trying to find space to take bread sows, all that sort of stuff. Um, we coordinate all of the employee training. Um, and then our, our, what we call our production managers, they're the next level up from the sow farm manager. They do regular visits to the farm and do audits um, so that we can explain to the owners what's going on with the farm when, when we get asked. The HR folks manage the entire hiring process. For, so from technicians all the way up to the farm manager for the farm. When we've got an open spot, our HR team is going to put out advertisements. They're going to recruit for it. They define the salary ranges that they think is appropriate for each role on that farm and in that geography. And then they're going to help to do phone interviews and initial screenings and hopefully deliver to the manager, who will make the final decision, a group of employees that are qualified for the role that we're trying to hire for. Um, benefits, salary, safety, all the nuts and bolts HR compliance stuff would be done within our, our office there at Carthage. Nutrition, uh, we do have an on-staff nutritionist, Dr. Andrea Hansen. She's awesome. I know many of you folks in here probably know Andrea. Um, she does a great job of setting up the diets for all of the farms that we manage. She's tremendous to work with, really bright. I really enjoy working with Andrea. Um, and then veterinary consulting, I said before, the, the number of sub-bullets really indicates how important we are. Uh, we just show up and basically tell all these groups that they've got it all screwed up, and then we go home for the day. So... Um, we also do administration. I mentioned we do these quarterly meetings with the owners. So those board meetings, uh, the annual ones are a legal requirement for LLCs, um, but ultimately help to keep those LLCs. Each farm is its own LLC. We keep those um, uh, in compliance with all the applicable regulations, make sure we're paying taxes on time, all that sort of stuff. Um, contracts, agreements, basically everything to keep the farm legal, we're in charge of that. Logistics, I mentioned, can be a, a challenge in our business um, because with 200 different owners to please, everybody's got a special request, right? Well, I can't get pigs at this time, and I don't want pigs on that day, and I need a little extra time here. Can I move my pigs up there? So our logistics team is probably bigger than for a lot of comparable size systems, um, but it's because we really focus on trying to provide exactly what the customer wants. And environmental, um, obviously that's uh, uh, table stakes. You've got to be in compliance with everything. That's something that uh, Dr. Henry Wilson on our team, he runs the environmental side. He has really had to expand his knowledge as we've expanded geographies. Every state has their own regulations, and so Henry has to be an expert not only in the Illinois environmental regulations, but also now in Missouri and Canada and Nebraska. I wanted to show you guys a little bit of some examples of our growth. This is the first farm that was uh, built as a part of the Carthage system. This is Prairie State, um, and maybe some folks in here even got gilt out of this thing at some point. Uh, this farm was originally a 1200. You can see the original barn here that's gotten doubled. Um, so farrowing right here, gestation, now we doubled it. Another gestation barn and more farrowing there. Does have some on site nursery and feeder pig space. This is really kind of a unique situation. We don't have all that extra space on a lot of the farms because these are for customer sales. Some folks want feeder pigs, some folks want wieners, some want selects. We try to again meet the, the demand for, for what folks want. Um, we have always been heavily focused on biosecurity. And that's uh, a wonderful part about working for Carthage as a veterinarian is we really work to try and prevent disease outbreaks. We don't prevent all of them but we have a very good track record for PERS and PED outbreak rates relative to the industry. Compost shed right here that you see is a non-negotiable. When we build a sow farm, it's got compost. Um, and that's something I fought at Mashoffs for years and years and years. I know they're expensive. I know they're hard to manage. The rendering truck is probably the biggest risk coming onto your farm every single day. So if you can eliminate that risk, it's a wonderful thing. 
Um, I've heard all the feedback of, well, we can't manage the compost, and when we can't manage it, then we've got to start rendering anyway, right? So we've just spent a bunch of money, and we really didn't get rid of the risk. I would tell you that since I've been with the system, we haven't rendered a single pig. It can absolutely be done. You may have to overbuild your compost a little bit, right? Uh, you may have to look at some alternative technologies in some of the newer barns. We've got some air bubbler systems that help to reduce the amount of time the compost takes. Um, but the, the reality is, if you focus on biosecurity, and I know Noel's going to talk a little bit about this later, you focus on biosecurity, you make it easy for the farm to do, they will comply with what you're asking. So this one was built in 1995. You can see a tra traditional setup there. Now you can see here in 2001, as we started another phase of growth, you can see the farm size grew quite a bit, and this farm was built to be a 5200 from the start. Um, you can also see that the design changed just a little bit. We've got our compost here, so biosecurity is still king. Got that compost shed there. This is our on-site nursery and gilt developer unit. Okay? All of our farms, much like the biosecurity non-negotiables, are going to have on-site gilt development. We really believe that good gilt acclimation is critical to having healthy wean pigs. And so this farm is not a multiplier. It's not making its own gilts. It's going to receive gilts as weaners from one of our multipliers every four weeks. It'll go into a nursery that's on this side of the building right here, and that batch of gilts will hang out in there for eight weeks. So we'll have two batches of gilts in the nursery at any given time. After they've tested their way out of that isolation period, we'll move them into the grower and finisher side, which is the rest of this barn, and we'll start to do the normal gilt development things. We'll start to do their pre-breeding vaccinations. We'll do the selection at 20 weeks of age. We'll go ahead and start doing the boar exposure soon after that. Um, gilt acclimation, if it's a mycoplasma positive farm, we'll certainly do that as early as we possibly can so that we don't have coughing pigs when we're shipped to our owners. We've got two gestation barns here connected to this gilt developer, so everything starts to flow this direction from here. Uh, and then you can see our, uh, our farrowing barn here, and kind of hard to get the scale, but that's a pretty long farrowing barn when you're talking about a 5200. That's a, a single wide farrowing barn, so the motel style farrowing with a hallway that runs right down here, and then our office right there. And this would have been a pretty classic design that was used for about four or five years. This farm has been retrofitted to be uh, negative, still negative pressure, but it is a filtered farm. It was not built filtered, but had some disease challenges. And so, okay, there's a technology solution for this. We're uh, filtered from about, let's call it middle of May until, say, middle of October every single year. Or, pardon me, the opposite of that, middle of October to middle of May. And then we bail out of that filter situation in the summer so that we can move enough air through the barn. Uh, we do also have boar studs that we manage. Uh, this is the second one that was built in 2003. I think uh, Doug Growth really oversees the boar studs in our system. I think we're somewhere around 1,700 boars that we manage right now. Um, predominantly PIC genetics, um, but we do have one DNA stud as well. Um, here you can see we kind of migrate to a, a newer design and really just kind of made the, it's the same design, just bigger. Still got the compost, still got the, in this case we split the nursery for the isolation nursery in its own building, but nursery, GDU, gestation barn, here we've got farrowing in the middle and then another gestation barn, okay. Now we've made the farrowing really, really long. This farrowing house is over a quarter mile long, okay. <laughs> The sow farm manager who works at this farm, or who, uh, he's now a production manager, but a guy who worked at this farm told me he wore one of those pedometer things one day, and he walked six and a half miles at work that day. That's a lot of walking to do. And that transitions to a different barn design. Apparently, he complained to the right people, and somebody listened and said, all right, let's do something about that. Similar layout, where you can see you get the GDU over here, and then you get gestation barn, gestation barn, but here's your farrowing now. So a double wide farrowing with a central hallway. Um, that's really cut down on the number of steps that the people and the animals have to, to take. And nothing is worse than dead time, right? When you go back to this, it is Murphy's Law. On this particular farm here, the office is right up at the top of the sparrowing house. And if you're out here working in the GDU and you forgot something you needed in the office, I mean, it's a 15-minute walk to get there. So you just killed 30 minutes if you forgot something you needed. And not that maybe anybody would ever do that on purpose, right? Um, but that's a labor killer if you got that issue. So if you can reduce steps, that's a huge opportunity. And really, since we have went to the double-wide farrowings, we haven't had any issues with ventilating them. So we continue to build those still today. And now even uh, positive pressure double-wide farrowings. 
I mentioned that we've got a, a research program at Carthage. This is a really unique asset in that research program. This farm is a research farm, and it's a research sow farm. It's got an ESF system in it, so we can track individual animal feeding, not maybe consumption, but feeding. Uh, we can do a lot of neat things with that ESF system. It's got some additional feed bins uh, and two uh, rooms specifically in the farrowing house that are set up to do individual feeding of specific sows throughout the lactation period. And if you couple this research farm with our wean to finish research assets, we can really do what they call it, semen to cellophane research. I mean, we can do uh, sire line trials that are connected all the way through. We can do nutritional trials all the way through. And one of the tricks that I learned early in my veterinary career is always to ask people on the, uh, you know, they're trying to sell me a product. If they say, well, we collected this data through the end of the nursery, I'd say, well, did the pigs keep that growth through the end of the finishing period, right? Well, we can answer a lot of those questions because we can say, yes, we've collected data. We know what happened with the dam. We know what happened with the sire. We know what happened with the offspring. And that makes these two a really neat combination. I know a lot of folks who've got these setups. I don't know many people who've got this sort of setup where you can get a tremendous amount of sow data on the research side. So we think that's really special and that's something we really try to leverage as often as we can. Uh, this would be an example of a farm that we did not build, but we do manage it. So we've had some producers come to us from time to time and say, hey, uh, in this case, this guy still manages a lot of his own sow farms in southern Indiana, but he got one of those deals you couldn't refuse on this farm. He bought it, and it's in central Illinois. And he'd done a lot of work with Aaron Lauer on our vet team, and he said, hey, Aaron, you know, maybe would you guys have some interest in managing this farm? You already recruit in this area. You got relationships, right? Um, it seemed like a natural fit. And so in this situation, we came up with kind of a unique contractual arrangement where we manage it. He gets to manage the parts that he wants to. If he wants to do the diets and that sort of stuff, fantastic. Um, but we came up with a system where we manage this sow farm. And as you can see, it's kind of a piece together, hodgepodge combination of a couple of farms that's grown and expanded through the years. Um, but we're pretty opportunistic. And if somebody comes to us and says, hey, I know this doesn't fit your business model, we try to jump on it. Now we jump forward to some farms that we've built here the last couple of years. Um, I promise we'll get to the Kansas farms eventually, but this one's still in Illinois. Uh, this is a farm that we built and uh, now is a uh, positive pressure and uh, uh, filtered farm. And it's filtered year around. So the negative pressures, we have to bail out of them in the summer to get enough airflow to move through. These are set up so that we are in filtration all the time, at least until the filter grids crack, right Noel? So this, you got double wide farrowing here on this barn. Here's your GDU and nursery. The nursery's up in the front part of it and then a gilt finisher and grower room there behind it. Compost there in the back. Uh, here is the office on this particular farm. Double wide farrowing like I mentioned. This is the loadout and nursery rooms, okay? And then you've got two gestation barns here. Um, we've gotten over some of the, the design challenges with making it one gestation barn now, and the most recent one we built is just one long gestation. But here we needed two sides to get more air to come into it. So you've got air coming in through uh, filters right here, right here, right here, and right here. Those air goes direct, that air gets pulled directly through those filters by big fans that are setting up blowing air directly into the attic right here. And then you notice there are no fans along the side of these walls. Because it's positive pressure, there's just uh, dampers there that open and shut to help control how much air is exiting the facility. As you would imagine, there's a little trial and error with ventilating these things. Um, I can still remember the first winter of this farm, and it got really cold for that first day. We got the, oh, there's a few water lines broken right now. Um, but you, you fix them, you learn from them. Uh, the new ventilation systems, we have Maximus in this particular farm, but obviously there's lots of good ventilation systems out there. The new ventilation systems really help us to manage the air pressures in the attic. And I would tell you the differential between the air pressure between your attic and your room is absolutely critical. Once you can get the system to hone in on that and manage it, these positive pressure farms actually become fairly easy to, to operate and ventilate from my perspective. All right. This is the first farm that we built out here in Kansas. This is the one that's up by Osborne, Kansas. Um, this farm right here is a, a unique design from what you've seen because you don't see a gilt developer on it. Now this farm does produce its own replacement females. So there are growing gilts on this farm. They keep gilts every week, keep their own future replacements back as wieners every single week. That gilt developer is actually stuck down here 
just because of the, the way the layout sets, at least this is what Joe's told me, just because of the way the layout sets, we had to set it up this way. So a little bit unique in that our office is actually kind of embedded in here. This is all farrowing in this part of the barn, and then we've got uh, wean to finish, or pardon me, finishing rooms down here, and some nursery rooms right here. This would be all gestation right here. This farm is negative pressure, and it's not filtered. We felt that the location was so good that we could not filter the farm, at least see how it goes. We did set it up so that you could uh, add on out here and filter these farms if needed. Um, you, we would convert them probably to positive pressure if we wanted to do that. Uh, but we can, we can filter this if we absolutely have to. And, uh, but, but to date, we've had good luck here and, and hopefully don't have to do that cost. This is the second farm that we built. Um, built this on an existing site, and you can see some of the old barns here. Uh, we actually leveraged the old barns to do the breeding project in uh, while this uh, farm was being constructed. This would be more kind of the classic design of what we're building. Uh, this is actually 12 wean to finish gilt development rooms in here. So you got a long hallway, motel style building with 12 individual wean to finish rooms that are tunnel ventilated with air blowing out this way. Here's your double wide farrowing house with an office up front. Here's that holding room and loadout area. Uh, and then we've got our, our gestation barn right here. And you can't really see it, but this is actually two different rooms. Um, two different rooms, two, two big rooms right there. Uh, compost right there. And then uh, you can see the old barns uh, still around there. Uh, this would be the last farm that we built here in Kansas. Just got it up and running less than a, a year ago. Um, this one's out towards Hayes, just uh, would be just south of Pfeiffer. Um, so very similar design to what we just looked at. 12 wing to finish rooms. I really like that setup. Um, it'd be nice if you had maybe a few more rooms so you could get it down to just about two weeks worth of gilts in each room. But we've got about uh, two and a third weeks worth of gilts in each room, and they seem to do really well in there. Um, double wide farrowing barn here. The office is actually stuck right up here in this. Um, the loadout for this one is, you can barely see it right there, but the holding room and loadout is just adjacent to the office right there. And then you've got your gestation barns here. These were some older barns that were already on the site. Uh, those have since been demoed and, and we actually didn't use those at all for anything. Big compost right back there. Um, can't highlight that piece of it enough. All right, so why did we choose Kansas to come out here and build these new farms? I don't think I'm going to give you anything that's really um, uh, mind-blowing. I think mostly this is going to be common sense stuff that you guys will think, yeah, that makes sense. But the first thing is the, the farm to community relationship. Kansas has got a great reputation as being an agricultural friendly state. Um, Illinois is teetering on that reputation a little bit, right? Um, it's harder and harder to build farms in Illinois. Harder and harder to build farms, honestly, in a lot of states in the Midwest that are big agricultural states, which is unfortunate, but it's the realities. So we felt like uh, we could come in and we could build farms that not only would be permittable, but also very well accepted by the communities. And I would tell you that in general, that's absolutely been true. Uh, appropriate labor culture. Kansas has got a lot of farm kids. Uh, and that was something that was very valuable to us. Maybe not to fill every technician role on the farm, but particularly as you think about developing section leads, your breeding leads, your farrowing lead, your person who's taking care of your gilts, the farm manager, the farm's assistant manager, there's no training program for those roles today. I always tell people that hiring an accountant is easy, and I apologize if anybody is in here as an accountant. I don't mean that as a, as a put down. But there are programs that make accountants every day. <coughs> hiring a vet is easy. There's programs that make vets, and it's pretty easy to see if you're qualified. You just got to show them your diploma. Even from Illinois, your diploma counts to be a veterinarian. <laughs> but in all seriousness, there's, where, where do you go to hire a breeding lead, right? Where do you go to hire an assistant manager? And a lot of times, some of the technicians may not want to be long-term employees in our business. It may be a, a pass-through role for them to get a different job. But we felt like with these um, local communities and animal agriculture background and some of the kids that we would bring in, that we could develop those leaders for the farm with time. They're very interested in animal agriculture. They want to be involved in it. There's, uh, there's not programs that are creating new sow farm managers every day. We know we've got to develop a lot of those on our own. And so we felt like this was a good place to get a core group of young folks and start to, to grow them up with the system. It's more of a long-term view. That's going to be a long-term investment, but we think that's a, a very nice asset that the state's got. And then local relationships. Um, several folks in here that I want to thank. 
I use the quote, it takes a village, right? Not just to raise a kid, but to manage a farm. Um, the folks at Abilene Animal Hospital, um, Lisa, Megan, Trevor, Steve, thank you guys for all the work that you've done. You're always willing to help out. Um, save me a lot of driving sometimes when we need some diagnostic samples. Uh, really appreciate all the help that you guys have been. Uh, the entire team here at Kansas State University, uh, it's been a lot of fun for me to get to know some of the folks here. Um, not long after uh, starting to come out here, I think Steve, you might have connected me, and Jordan, you were uh, instrumental in that as well, and saying, hey, we got some, some veterinary students. Would you want to come in and spend some time with them? I've done that a couple of times and really enjoyed it, so thank you guys for giving me that opportunity. Um, and then local producers out here, um, Kramers, really appreciate all your guys' support um, and, and everybody who's been involved. Can't thank you enough for allowing us to, to come into your industry and be a part of it. Um, uh, this last piece, I can't highlight enough. Uh, and this was something that I uh, experienced when I was at the mash-offs. We would grow uh, geographically, and the local plumber who's done all the plumbing on all your farms for 40 years and knows everything about it, that guy's invaluable. When you grow geographically, I may be willing to drive out to Salina, Kansas. He may not be as excited about driving out to Salina, Kansas all the time that we have plumbing issues. Okay? So developing local infrastructure, I think, is really key to success. Making inroads with some of these uh, folks in the trades like uh, welders, plumbers, electrician, you really need those folks to keep your farms functioning. This is kind of a, 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 no, uh, a duh type slide, but the biosecurity success, if you look at any of the ranking systems and scoring systems, they all put the most value on pig density. You can manage some of the risk of pig density and aerosol transmission with filtration, but the reality is if you're in a pig dense area and you gotta go hire one of these plumbers or electricians or welders to come work in your farm, what's the odds in Iowa of the local electrician having been to another pig farm? really high, right? If he's willing to come to your pig farm, he's probably willing to go to Knowles and everybody else's, all right? Um, if you're raising pigs in a very non-pig dense area, you don't have that, I shouldn't say you don't have that risk, that risk is less because the local electrician probably hadn't been to a pig farm. He may have been to a feed lot, he may have been to a lot of livestock operations, but if there aren't many pig farms in the area, he probably hasn't been to the pig farm. So it's kind of the ecosystem biosecurity approach when it comes to, to pig density. And we thought that that was uh, really attractive. You can see Kansas up here on this kind of heat map. There's a lot of counties in Kansas that make sense to lay down genetic assets because you can keep those animals healthy there. And when you're raising genetic animals, they have to be healthy. They are a horrible meat animal, horrible meat animal. And the day you make them sick, they become a meat animal. And they just are not a very good producing animal. So that's a problem for everybody involved when that happens. Um, I do think it's important to highlight that the pig density thing is a transient ranking. Okay? It changes every year. In West Central Illinois, where I grew up in West Central Illinois, it used to be a PIC you know, multiplier area. Um, enough pigs moved in there that it is no longer a PIC multiplier area. Right? Missouri has seen tremendous expansion in their state over the last couple of years because folks figured out they could get farms permitted. They knew it was biosecure, not very pig dense, and so they laid down assets there. Now Missouri is not as, uh, let's say, biosecure as it used to be. And sometimes you find out that maybe uh, in states like Missouri, you didn't have the best biosecurity behaviors, and you got away with it because there wasn't any pig density to pressure the contamination of people and supplies coming into the farm. Well, as you add pig density, you increase the contamination of disease, now some of those bad biosecurity behaviors show up in terms of disease outbreaks. So I just share that with you as a lesson learned. It's a great asset to have today. Always continue to monitor it because it can change pretty quick. Feed costs are certainly competitive here in Kansas. Uh, maybe not as good as you know, our traditional area there in Illinois where we're blessed to have all sorts of uh, uh, grain farmers right around us, um, but certainly also not bad. And we think a, a very fair trade-off for the, the biosecurity improvements that we get with low pig density. Lee talked about some of these uh, risks. I'll probably highlight a couple of the same things that he did. Um, but exports and trade, um, you know, it's something that we think about all the time, and we probably think about it way more than we should. I say we as veterinarians, because we can't, we aren't going to do anything about it, right? We're recipients of what's going to go on in, in the industry and in the globe. Um, this picture came out, I think, when they met in South America. I love this picture. I hope they're saying grace, because if you look at it, their eyes are all closed. So they're either saying grace at the meal or they're asleep right now. I hope it's not asleep because I would love it if they were actually talking to each other. I think that'd be good for our industry. 
Um, we bring up China as a, uh, a potential um, trade partner a lot, and you talk to a lot of people that say, man, if we could just sell that pork in China, right? A billion consumers, and they love to eat pork. That's true. I don't think China is ever going to be a wonderful trade partner for us. I think they'll be very fickle. I think they will... Um, let, me, let me cut to the chase. The Chinese value different things than we do in the trade situation. We can produce pork that is safe from a food safety standpoint and really, really cheap. The Chinese kind of like the food safety thing. They don't care about the cheap thing. Their pork, you, you saw the price of production and you didn't see, or the, the cost of production, you didn't see China listed on that list because it's very expensive to raise pigs in China. But the consumers are used to paying a very high price for the pork. So if they have to go buy pork, yeah, they could come buy U.S. pork because that would be cheapest. But they don't need to because they don't need to cut the price of their pork in half, right? So I would just urge us to consider that when we think about China as a wonderful trade opportunity. When we can sell them pork, that's wonderful. When they have the Olympics in Beijing, we should take advantage of that every single time we can. I don't know that we should ever build an industry that is going to try to surface them because I think they will be a very fickle trade partner. Um, foreign animal disease. Uh, this scares the crap out of me. Really, really, really it does. And I, I'm, I'm fear-mongering, I know, but please think about biosecurity in everything that you do. It used to be that we thought about biosecurity as, well, I need my farm to stay healthy because then I can make a lot of pigs and I can make a lot of money. We need every farm to stay healthy right now. African swine fever, foot and mouth disease, classical swine fever, the number of countries that don't have those diseases is getting lower and lower every year. And we are blessed that we are still on the list of the countries that don't have those diseases, but that's a transient status. I am really nervous about our risk of ASF introduction. You think about the percentage of pork being produced in the world that is contaminated with ASF. And remember, contaminated pork mean, with ASF means your pigs get ASF from it. It's a very unique disease, okay? Think about the percentage of pork that's being produced that has ASF in it right now. China produces over half the world's pork. They're dumping six million sows. Do you think those sows have ASF? Maybe. There's a decent chance. We're going from 10 years ago where literally none of the world's pork supply had ASF in it to now it's crazy to think about how many billions of tons of pork are going to be contaminated with ASF. And I think this was actually from South America, but people travel with meat. They do it all the time. I fly back and forth to China about once a quarter to go work with producers over there, veterinarians over there. I love visiting China and I actually love the food, love the Chinese food. It is wonderful. It is very much a cultural and custom thing to travel with food when you're in China. You bring snacks, you bring gifts. It's very customary. Um, and the reality is this stuff is contaminated. And people aren't doing it to be malicious. They're doing it because that's what their customs are. That's what they're used to. So we need to be very cognizant about this risk and do everything we can to manage it going forward. Um, Joel, you did a great job of highlighting that raising pigs was a lot easier several years ago. Well, you know, it was just five years ago we talked about these things all the time, right? The regulatory oversight and what do we have to do with pen gestation and antibiotics and drought. We didn't even have these things on the to-do list, right? But now these things have kind of moved to, yeah, we really need to be concerned about them. They're still huge risks. Two bad, two bad crop years in a row, that could probably happen. Those are things that we need to be aware of, but again, we can't necessarily fix them. Change in pig density, I talked a little bit about that, won't belabor it. Um, labor shortage. Labor shortage is something that um, I will belabor a little bit because it's critical to our, our farms. Um, people are moving more and more from the rural areas to the urban areas. Young people want to live in the cities. I see it when I go to China. It's happening here in the United States. It's happened for hundreds of years. It will continue to happen. That's a big, big problem for us in our industry. Running out of labor is a huge concern and one that we have to think about and one we need to find creative solutions to. Uh, further basis uh, separation, uh, I mentioned the feed cost piece a little bit before. It's comparable today, but as we've seen with ethanol, um, there are unexpected changes in our world that can have dramatic impacts on feed prices. Don't, I'm not saying it's going to happen, I'm saying it's something we've got to be aware of, and, and even on the local side, regulatory and legislative changes. It could not only be national things, but also local government things that have big, big impacts on what we do. All right, so I'm going to try and uh, end this here by sharing a couple of thoughts. We'll see if I can get the videos to work here. My big take home that I wanted to share with you is I kind of gave some gloom and doom on risk there for a little bit, but a lot of that stuff we can't necessarily do anything about. 
So I wanted to share with you something that uh, working on with the farms out here right now to try and help manage something we can do something about, which is transportation biosecurity. All right. The truck that comes to pick up the wean pigs for my farm is probably the biggest risk showing up. Okay. I got rid of the rendering truck. I can't get rid of the wean pig truck or the cull sow truck. All right. And our farm, I think, has a nice design. But I loaded pigs at the farm in Nebraska a couple weeks ago when it was negative 20 wind chill and 40 mile an hour north wind blowing right at the chute when we put pigs on there. I didn't feel very good about the clean dirty line with me and the driver by the time we got done with that little expedition, right? That's really easy for me as a vet to sit in an office and say, well, spray paint a line on the, on the floor and then don't go past that line, okay? The pigs don't respond to that message, all right? The people will respond but when they get tired, when they get frustrated, there's always temptation to break the rules, okay? So this is something that we're trying to work on. I just want to share it with you in, in kind of the spirit of manage the risk you can control. This one's a huge risk. We all have it, and we should all manage it. Just to kind of give you the layout a little bit, we'll see if these play. I, I, I think they will turn the right way once we... So a little bit hard to see. But that's the holding nursery. So we're getting our counts in that holding nursery. He's counting those pigs as they go, and he's taking the truck driver one cut. And I think that's important because it gives the truck driver a fair chance to keep those pigs on the trailer, right? We take them a cut at the time, and we stage those pigs. This next room is the loadout room, so the chute's in that next room. We stage those pigs so we can move them as one group as quickly as possible up that ramp and onto the truck. And the trucker can then take them, put them in that cut of the trailer, and shut his gate behind them, we don't have to worry as much about the pigs running back and forth on there. So that's one thing I wanted to highlight to you, and I'll show you what happens there in the, in the actual loadout room after this. So we got somebody dedicated right here. There's actually two people in there. You see he's got Tyvex on, rubber gloves, and you'll see plastic boots there in a minute. This guy stays in that loadout room. He does not come into the folding room nursery. This room is dirty. This room right here is clean and part of the farm. So it's an additional barrier by having dedicated people in this room. The sort boards, the shakers, whatever equipment you need stays in that room. There's no reason to bring it back to the farm when they're done loading pigs. Take off their Tyvek, take off their boots, all that stuff can stay in this room and get tossed out to shoot of trash after that driver pulls away. This is the part where I get nervous, right? When it's cold, those pigs balk right there. When they're doing their best to manage the clean dirty line, the reality is that's really hard to do, right? Those pigs are going back and forth on the trailer, back onto the dock. Not a lot you can do about that risk, so let's dedicate some folks in there and let them stay in there with dedicated equipment to fly. And then once we get done, you got a power washer hooked up there, a wand and a hose that live in there, and they can instantly wash that room out and disinfect it when they're done. Take off my tie bag, my plastic boot, go back out, and then shower into the farm again. So these folks have to shower into the farm to wean, and then shower in again after they're done weaning to try and decontaminate them. So I think that's my last oh, a couple of slides here real quick. Um, we do very much remain bullish on the future of, of the U.S. and the swine industry. Um, you guys have probably all heard this stuff, and other people more qualified can give it than me. But while we complain a lot about the politics and the, the regulatory environment we're in, the reality is they're the best in the world. So, yeah, do they suck sometimes? Sure. But it's still better than most of our neighbors. So uh, with a global, expand, a middle class that's expanding, big worldwide population that's got to be fed, we think there's huge opportunities for farmers going forward. And while we don't necessarily have any plans to build a farm in Kansas this year, we remain very open to continuing to grow in Kansas. Experience has largely been uh, very positive. And again, many thanks to the folks in here who've helped contribute to that. So with that, I apologize if we went over time. If we do have time, we'll be happy to take questions. Let's give Clayton a round of applause. We'll have time for a question or two as we transition. Any questions for Clayton? Yep, right here.
Yep. So the question was describing the compost process a little bit and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, whatever tricks we try to use to make that process easier and more effective. Um, I am not qualified to give you the full answer, but I'll tell you what I know about it. Um, the aeration thing that I mentioned, we actually have cut grooves in the bays of the uh, composter, of the compost, and those cut grooves are about 12 inches apart. And there is black plastic air hose with uh, seep holes in it, kind of like a, a seep hose you'd use for your garden, that line that thing. And when you first see it, you think to yourself, this is never going to work, right? Those things are going to plug instantly. There's no way it's going to work. I would tell you we've put them into all the new farms we've built in the last three years, uh, two years, and not a single one if we had any issues with those air lines plugging up. Uh, in each bay, those lines come together at the back and run up the wall to a, um, uh, a motor that is pushing air in th into that system. So it's pulling air into that, pushing it through, and pushing it up through the compost, essentially. Um, I don't know the run times on the motors, so I apologize on that, and I can get you some more information if you're interested. I, they're not running all the time, but I, I, I don't know if they're on an automatic timer or if it's something that they do every day. They switch it on and run it there for a little bit. Uh, we don't use anything that I'm aware of added to the compost to try and help with the, uh, the, the composting process itself. For organic sources, it just depends, carbon sources, just depends on where we're at. Um, out in Kansas, uh, uh, straw would be the most common thing I'm aware of that we're using. Okay. Well, good. Well, let's give Clayton one last round of applause, and I know he'll be here through the lunch hour as well. <laughs>